How's everyone doing? The spotlight's shining in my face. I cannot see any of your faces, so I'm just going to pretend I'm talking to myself. Spoiler alert, what you're going to be getting from me over the next 30 minutes is exactly as the title says. You'll be hearing about topography, about layout, and about design, all in the context of the web. So there's not a lot of JavaScript here, I'm afraid, but I do hope you will stick around and hear me out. Given this is JSConf and all, I think it's safe to assume that everyone in this room has had some experience with the web. So I'd like everyone to hold this question in your minds for a little bit. What does the web mean to you? For me, I love the web. It's the World Wide Web, right? And I was a lucky kid in that even though our family was far from rich, I've always had a computer in my house. I think my parents needed to do it, use it for work or something, but I was more concerned about the games on there. And my first experience with the web, if this works, sounds something like this. No. This is music to my ears. And if you've never heard this sound before, well, you're obviously not from my generation. And when I think about the web, I think about how amazing it is that it can connect the world's population. In fact, without the web, odds are we would never have crossed paths, and I wouldn't be standing here on this stage talking to you about the web. So, Star Trek Discovery, anybody? Okay, one. Oh, come on, man. So this beautiful woman is Michelle Yeoh, one of the greatest female action stars of all time and pride of Malaysians everywhere. Now, when she, when she first got to Hollywood, people were amazed that she could speak English so well. And she, in turn, was equally amazed that people in Hollywood had such a terrible grasp of world geography, seeing as they did not know where Malaysia was. I'm sure many people from America and Europe know exactly where Southeast Asia is. I mean, look around you. Look at all the expats. No offense if you are one. But I have also met people whose idea of Asia was limited to China, India, or Japan. So this is a very helpful map that I've created to show people where exactly we are. So Southeast Asia is made up of 11 countries, and every single one of them has their own distinct culture. English is taught in schools across the region, but we have so many other languages as well. And of the world's 7.6 billion people, only 4.9% are native English speakers, but 51.2% of websites are in English. So something isn't quite right about this ratio. The world is beautiful because of its cultural diversity. Language is a part of a society's cultural heritage and is especially important for the maintenance of it. Now, the web is an informational medium in that people go online to find out about things. Even if you're going online to purchase something, don't you need information about the product you're going to buy? So the priority is always content. The web is only useful to the people who can understand the content on it which is why I'm slightly comforted to know that internationalization is a priority at the W3C. It is crucial that a technology meant to be ubiquitous supports the creation of local content across the world, that every writing system in the world can be correctly rendered on the web. Just to prove a point, these are the various scripts in use in Southeast Asia, and they can all be displayed and laid out correctly on the web today with better Unicode support and font technologies for the individual characters, as well as various CSS properties for overall layout, we now have a means to carve out a space on the web that truly belongs to each of us, that truly feels like home. Before I go any further, I really should introduce myself. My name is Hui Jing, and I'm from, sorry, I'm from Malaysia. I used to play basketball full-time, and it was what kick-started my web career. I also has as the home they've introduced, I have an inordinate love of CSS, to the point where I'm compelled to write and speak about it, including hijacking a JSCOM session to sneak in some CSS talk. Now, somebody once asked me this question. 
Do developers even care about topography? And I think they do. But maybe I'm wrong, I usually am. How many of you think topography is important? Thank you. Now, topography has always been an integral part of human-computer interaction and software design. There's a very good reason why Apple has an entire section dedicated to topography in the Apple developer's human interface guidelines. And you may disagree with me, but I feel that as a front-end developer, the code we write impacts how our sites or applications look. So we too have a share of the responsibility in the design of our products. Oliver Reichenstein said this in his article back in 2006, and he reiterated that the web as a medium is all about information. Textual content is the most straightforward method of delivering information on the web. And whether we like it or not, topography is increasingly becoming what differentiates a good website from bad. Let's be honest. People are superficial, and they have really short attention spans these days. The topography, layout, and design of your site or application are like the clothes you wear, and people make judgments of their first impressions of you or your product based on what they see. There are many definitions of topography out there, and I personally like this one by Garrett Norje. Letters are the building blocks of a writing system, regardless of language. Now, I believe there is a pretty diverse mix of languages spoken by the audience here today, and while a large number of these languages are alphabetic, Chinese is not one of them. Chinese is a logographic writing system where each character is composed within a uniform square. This allows Chinese to be read efficiently regardless of whether it is set horizontally or vertically. And until proven otherwise, it seems that the Chinese script developed separately from the Proto-Sinaitic scripts, which were the origins of alphabetic languages. This is why the Western languages in Europe are inherently different from the Eastern languages in Asia. Alphabetic languages which originated from the Phoenician alphabet combine a small set of letters to form all the words the language needs for the purpose of communication. Chinese characters, on the other hand, number in the tens of thousands, each a unique glyph that can express meaning on their own or be used in combination with other glyphs. For example, hippopotamus. This is an English word that takes 12 letters to spell. In Chinese, we only need two characters, herma. Lebensgefürte. This is a German word that takes 14 letters to spell. In Chinese, we can say banyu. Grünreifedeurokter. This is an Irish word of 21 letters, and again in Chinese, show you. What can I say? Chinese is a concise language. The appearance of the earliest letter forms was directly influenced by the tools that were used to create them, and they continually evolved in tandem with the limitations of the technologies of their time. So take the Latin alphabet, for example, which is derived from Greek. The earliest letters were sans serif when writing was done with a heartbeat pen. Serifs may have came about due to a transition to a square cut writing implement, like a flat stiff brush. Later scribes and copyists used quill pens. And as demand for written matter grew, they developed more efficient styles of writing, evolving the letter forms yet again. When it comes to classifying script styles, Latin-based scripts can broadly be placed into two big categories of serifs and sans serifs. Now, Chinese characters also changed a lot since their origins. It's just that Chinese writing went through the entire process of development and evolution way earlier than Europe. The key implement of Chinese writing is the brush. Calligraphy was, and still is, one of the most highly regarded Chinese arts. The works of famous calligraphers were used as the basis for carving wood blocks for printing. These days, typefaces used for printing Chinese publications can broadly be classified into the following families. We have Song Ti, also known as Ming Ti, Kai Ti, Fang Song Ti, and Hei Ti. Now, the last two are 20th century creations, so it's really recent. Chinese typefaces are extremely challenging to create, simply due to the volume of glyphs required. The average number of glyphs for a Chinese system font clocks in at around 35,000 glyphs, give or take a few thousand. And typefaces that have enough glyph coverage to be used in body copy are usually made by foundries, as very few independent type designers have the bandwidth for that. 
Now, language and writing have allowed human beings to communicate ideas and record history for thousands of years, and we've written on almost anything we could get our hands on. But right now, the medium of our time is the screen and the browser. Our types are now font files, and we've replaced typesetting with composing sticks with CSS. But remember this. An electronic display is a proxy medium. Whatever we see displayed on a screen comes from data encoded as electronic signals, and the heart of electronic displays is light. It is transient. We cannot reach out and touch light. Now, the web isn't even 30 yet, and this young medium is nothing like we've seen before. It is dynamic and interactive. Now, some designers, especially those who aren't used to, especially those who are used to having absolute control over their final presentations, tend to find this disturbing, right? And although it may be tempting to view the web as simply print expressed on an electronic screen, it is not. It is a unique medium of its own. When we talk about topography on the web, one of the first things that comes to mind is web fonts. So let's start off with some basics. What is a font? Now, in the world of metal typesetting, this is a font, which refers to a complete set of metal types that were used to typeset entire pages of text. And if you can see the tiny text label, this set being shown is for Caslon 12 point. But in the digital world, these are fonts, specifically font files. For both analog and digital fonts, you can think of them as collections of glyphs, which begs the next question, what are glyphs? Now, a glyph is the specific shape of a letter or character in a particular font. So this is a glyph, this is a glyph, that's also a glyph. In the digital world, everything is data. So glyphs can be described as with an array of pixels or collections of vector images or paths of Bezier curves in straight lines. Different font formats store information about the font, like their glyphs, their encodings, metadata about the font, etc., differently based on how their specifications were written because, you know, data formats, right? And if you've ever used web fonts before, you'd have seen at least some of these formats. And if you've ever wondered why there were so many, well, there's a little bit of history involved here. So the earliest fonts were pixel-based bitmaps, which didn't work out so well when it came to high-resolution printing. So a lot of smart people worked to solve this problem, and one of the solutions came from Adobe founder John Warnock. He created PostScript in 1985, which was the very first vector font, and it really took off. So TrueType was Apple and Microsoft's answer to Adobe's font monopoly. And eventually, Microsoft turned to Adobe, and together they came up with OpenType. Now, Microsoft also came up with EOT, which is Embedded OpenType, a proprietary format for use on web pages. And although they tried to submit this to the W3C as a recommendation, it was rejected in favor of WOF, Web Open Font Format. Now, WOF 2 is simply an improvement over WOF with significantly better compression rates. On the practical side of things, we use the font phase rule to declare a list of different font formats in the hopes that our fonts will show up correctly in as many browsers as possible. The number of web formats that we need to declare has decreased over the years, and right now you can pretty much get away with declaring just WOF and WOF2. The font phase rule has more descriptors, but only these two, the font family and source, are mandatory. So if either of either one of them are absent, the entire font phase rule is ignored. Now, the font family descriptor is simply a label that we reference in other CSS declarations. So even if you're using a font like Helvetica, you could actually call it dumplings, and it would still work. Then the source descriptor is a comma-separated list of external references or locally installed font phase names. It is made up of a declaration of the font file's location, and an optional font hint. So if the browser doesn't support a particular font format stated in the hint, it won't even bother loading the font at all. So the next three descriptors for style, weight, and stretch are used to match styles to a particular typeface in later declarations. So technically, you could assign a black typeface to a font weight of 100 and proceed to confuse your entire team who cannot figure out why setting a weight of 100 gives them this massively black typeface. Perhaps an idea for April Fool's Day, hashtag don't get fired. 
Then we have the Unicode range descriptor, which allows us to create composite fonts that mix glyphs from different fonts for different scripts. So sometimes the Latin characters for Chinese fonts don't look particularly nice. This is more apparent on the older Windows systems, to be honest. So the Unicode range descriptor allows us to specify a specific font file to be loaded for individual code points or a range of code points. So in this example, I've created a font family called Haiti Plus because, you know, naming things is hard. But Haiti Plus will use the Haiti SC font for everything, but the second rule will tell the browser to use the Mechanica font for all Latin characters instead. The Firefox DevTools has a font panel which shows which fonts are loaded on your page. And although it's really small, you can try to squint and see that both Haiti SC and Mechanica are loaded for my custom font family, Haiti Plus. Now, if a page does not contain any Latin characters, Mechanica will not be loaded at all because it's not needed. Now, font descriptors and CSS properties look very similar, but are two completely different things. Chris Lilly, who chaired the group that developed FontFace, explained it really well in his .css talk, that properties are requests for styling, and descriptors are descriptions of capabilities. So a font weight bold within a FontFace rule means that this font can do bold, while a font weight bold applied as a, applied as a property means please style this element with a font that can do bold. It's kind of a subtle difference. So these here are CSS font properties. So from what I've seen, properties like font size, font weight, and font style are pretty commonly used. Font stretch, maybe a little bit less. And the last two, which are font size adjust and font synthesis, I've almost never seen used in the wild before. So let's talk a bit about those two, which were newly added to the fonts level three specification. Font size adjust was put in to address legibility issues because faces with low X heights may sometimes be less legible, especially when they're triggered as a fallback font. We can set the value of this property to an aspect ratio of the first choice font. So any fallback fonts triggered will have their font size adjusted to match this ratio. Font synthesis was put in to address the issue of faux bolts and faux italics because sometimes the true italic or heavier version of a font doesn't exist or the browser can't find it, and so the browser will try to compensate. Unfortunately, the end result often isn't pretty. So with this property, you can set it to a value of none to tell the browser, you know, it's fine, appreciate the effort, but no thank you. Now for the fun stuff. Font feature properties, which were introduced in fonts level three. Modern font technologies allow fonts to contain a lot more glyphs than before. So we can utilize a variety of typographic features like swashes, ligatures, old start numerals, and so on. And perhaps some of you might be wondering, what's the point? Why, why do we want to have all these typographic features? It's a waste of time. But no, they are part and parcel of good typography, which is necessary to hold your reader's attention. Now, the written word is a transference of speech, which is heard into something visual, which is seen. Good speakers will vary their cadence, they will use gestures, they'll emphasize certain words. Typographic features like small caps and correct use of italics and punctuation, they do the same for text. Now, other features like old star numerals and ligatures, they help maintain typographic color to make reading more comfortable. So these are the features you can turn on via CSS, but note that the font you're using must have these features to begin with. So this lot up here are the features most often mentioned at web typography talks. But almost nobody talks about font variant East Asian. What this property does is allow for glyph substitution and positioning in East Asian text. If you're unfamiliar with Han characters, it may seem like East Asian languages share the same glyphs, but it actually depends. Han unification involves assigning the same code point to different glyphs and has been quite a controversial issue, which we will not get into, but the point is that the same code point can have variant glyphs, depending on the language being used, like simplified Chinese glyphs versus traditional Chinese glyphs, Japanese glyphs have their own specification, known as GIS, or Japanese Industrial Standard, and they too have alternate glyphs for the same character. So this property allows us to toggle these variant glyphs. And when I mentioned open type earlier, I also want to point out that in September of 2016, version 1.8 of the specification introduced open type font variations. It was a joint development by Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Adobe. 
An open type variable font is one in which the equivalent of multiple individual fonts can be compactly packaged within a single font file. And this is potentially a big plus when it comes to performance, especially significant for fonts with large glyph sets, like all the CJK fonts. In addition to that, the dynamism of variable fonts is perfect for the web medium and opens up the possibility of new kinds of responsive topography. If you're interested in seeing how variable fonts behave, you'll have to check out Access Praxis by Lawrence Penny, which is essentially a playground for the available vari variable fonts on the web. So Taipei-based Type Foundry Arfic Technology, aka Wen Ding Kezi, created the first Chinese variable font called Wen Ding Jing Xi Hei, and you can play with it on Access Praxis. So vertical writing is traditionally East Asian for Han characters which are used in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. But when it comes to design, we can lay out text in all directions if we so choose. So I want to introduce the writing mode property, which deals specifically with vertical text. You literally turn the browser on its side. Now, some people might be saying, that's no big deal. We can already do this with CSS transforms, but it's kind of different. This is what happens to your text when the different values of writing mode are applied. The default is horizontal, top to bottom. To change the direction to vertical, we use vertical RL or vertical LR. Now, when we rotate text, it's not only the lines that change direction, because each line contains individual letters or characters, and they have an orientation as well. So for text orientation, the initial value is mixed. Browsers are smart enough to tell which languages can, can be typeset both vertically and horizontally or in one direction only. So Chinese characters, for example, will always be displayed upright, while horizontal-only languages will have their characters rotated when vertical. The text orientation property lets you control this, and you can always make all the characters upright or sideways if you want to. One more relevant property is text combine upright. This addresses the issue of numerals or abbreviations in vertical text. So a very common use case is dates, especially for Taiwan, where they use the Ming Guo calendar. This property lets us fit all the digits into the width of one character and display them upright. No browser supports the digits value yet, which allows us to dictate how many digits are acceptable to be squeezed into this space. The range allowed is supposed to be between two and four characters, but for now, with the all value, there is no limit. So you could sort of put a word like hippopotamus in there. It will work, but it will look horribly squished. Now, laying out content in a different direction does require a change in perspective. And I gleaned quite a few insights from working with vertical layout. For example, the techniques I was so used to for centering items worked a bit differently when it came to vertical layout. To vertically center a block, Setting the top and bottom margins to auto actually does work, unlike in horizontal writing, which is great. But trying to center something horizontally is an exercise in pain. The directions of top, right, bottom, left start getting a bit confusing when you have rotated Latin text. Say so you have this header, and you want some extra spacing between the header and the paragraph. Do you set the margin on the bottom of the header or to the left? It's actually the left, so it's kind of weird, which is why we have a CSS logical property specification, which introduces the new CSS properties that are flow relative equivalents of physical box model properties. So these properties use things like block start and block end or inline start and inline end instead of left and right. The specification is in the thick of working draft status, but I'm really eager to see it developed and implemented. For now, support is kind of spotty. Now, before I discovered the writing mode property, I did wonder to myself if it was possible to do vertical typesetting on the web. And the answer is a resounding yes. All three pro properties I covered earlier were used for this particular demo. And this is a layout I built for displaying Chinese text with a toggle that allowed readers to switch between vertical and horizontal layouts. It wasn't as straightforward as I thought it would be because a tricky thing was getting the images to orientate correctly. Now, it would have been nice to have a media query for writing mode so I could lay out my images accordingly with the picture element, but that doesn't exist yet. So I ended up working around the image issue with you know, CSS transforms instead. 
So yes, there is still work to be done to further develop Chinese typesetting on the web. And for all non-Latin based languages, actually. So the Chinese Layout Task Force, which I am a part of, aims to document requirements for the layout and presentation of text for the major languages of China when those languages are used by web standards. The document will provide requirements for the development of W3C standards affected by languages in, used in China, including Hanzi, Mongolian, Tibetan, and Uyghur scripts. Now, implementing vertical layouts has become much easier as browser vendors continue to improve the functionality of their products. And this opens up an aspect of graphic design that isn't often seen on the web at the moment. For example, you can make a bookshelf style list of posts with just CSS. Something like this can be done by applying vertical RL to each list item, plus some padding and inset box shadows for the visual effect. And another idea can be for headers. Because for horizontal languages, you wouldn't lay out long chunks of text vertically because that just makes things hard to read. But using vertical text for short titles or headers can really break up the monotony of a long page. Other subtle uses of vertical text could be for tags on blog posts where the information is not critical to the main content, so laying it out vertically doesn't adversely affect the reading experience. For languages meant to be read horizontally from top to bottom, vertical text should largely be decorative. We don't want to compromise the reading experience for long form passages, so and smaller screens, we can make use of media queries to revert to a horizontal layout that makes better use of the limited space. Now, conversely, there are instances where text rotated vertically can work on narrow screen sizes as well. Perhaps you realize that the hamburger menu is not the best mobile UI pattern that we came up with. So depending on the number of links that you have in your navigation, perhaps laying them out vertically on the side edge could be a design worth considering. And I'm sure many of you can come up with even more interesting designs that utilize vertical layouts. Statistically, there aren't that many sites that use the writing mode property. And when I started building vertical layouts, Grid hadn't landed yet, so I used Flexbox for a lot of my layouts. Flexbox support is great. I mean, it has wider coverage than border radius, right? But Flexbox with writing mode doesn't play too well together. I'll be honest, there are quite a large number of cross-browser issues, like in Firefox, if you don't specify a width on the element with a vertical writing mode, it just gets kicked off the page. They're working on it, by the way. But that doesn't mean we should shy away from using vertical text altogether. In fact, there's never been a better time than now to live on the cutting edge. Because evergreen browsers are a thing now, with bug fixes and new features being shipped faster than ever. CSS Grid, I feel, was one of the best rollouts of a new major CSS feature ever, with almost all the major browsers shipping it in March last year. By now, more than 70% of the market is using a browser that supports Grid. And here's a little secret I discovered. By raising bugs we find when trying out new features, we're actually showing browser vendors that these features are in demand. And this works both ways. If we don't use features simply because they are buggy, browser vendors will think that nobody really cares about that feature and choose to fix more pressing bugs instead. Now, if more of us use those features and raise the bugs we discover, it sends a signal to browser vendors that people are using these features and encourage them to address related bugs sooner rather than later, like what Yuna said this morning. So here's a long list of resources I referred to when preparing this talk, and I'll share these slides for anybody who's interested. And if you need inspiration for vertical layouts, the Tateyoko Web Awards site has a really nice showcase. Jen Simmons also has an experimental layout lab where she showcases all the different things that are now possible with modern CSS. And even if you don't end up using any of what I've covered today immediately in your next project, I mean, you're JS guys, aren't you? I hope that you keep these techniques and properties in the back of your mind. And maybe one day, when you're tired of building the same old layouts again and again, you'll reach for them and create something amazing. Thank you.